Good evening, everyone. I'm Cathy Hall. I'm Chief Operating Officer here at the Provatnik School of Government. And it's my pleasure on behalf of the whole team to welcome you, friends old and new, both here at the school and online, to this very special event. The Blavatnik School of Government is a department at the University of Oxford with a mission to support a world better led, better served and better governed through our programme of teaching, applied research and engagement with public leaders around the world. As part of this mission, it's been our privilege for the last five years to have partnered with the Hayward Foundation and with the support of Hartford College and the ESRC to host the Hayward Fellowship in honour of the highly respected and much missed former UK Cabinet Secretary, Jeremy Lord Hayward. The fellowship allows a very senior UK official to spend time here at Oxford exploring issues relating to public service and policy of interest to them and importance around the world. It's our pleasure this year to be hosting Jonathan Black, former UK Deputy National Security Advisor, and his team exploring the intersection of economic prosperity and national security. It's both a fascinating and timely subject, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to the lecture as much as I am. Following the lecture, we'll have time for some Q&A. So if you're joining us online, please do post your questions in the chat. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Tom Fletcher, Principal of Hartford College, who is our moderator this evening. Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Cathy, and um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to what I'm sure will be a fascinating hour of discussion uh, ahead of us. Uh, as Cathy says, I'm Tom Fletcher. I'm the principal of Hartford College, uh, the one with the bridge and the rather angry cat, uh, if you've passed through the quad uh, recently. Um, but more importantly for this evening, uh, a key partner of, uh, of Blavatnik. So I'm here as a super fan of Blavatnik and the work that is being done here to develop the next generation uh, of leaders and to expose them to practitioners like Jonathan, uh, like uh, Professor Kieran Martin, another former colleague uh, who is such a key part of Levantnik's work here and also a very proud member of uh, the Hartford community uh, as well. Um, I'm also very happy to be here, really to be at any event that bears the name of Jeremy Hayward and is connected to Jeremy Hayward and his extraordinary legacy for government and in the lives of many of us, uh, including many of us in the room uh, today. Uh, as Cathy says, Jeremy was an exceptional civil servant and an even more extraordinary human being. I think anyone who worked with him over the last three decades recognized that he was probably the outstanding civil servant, not just of his generation, but of the post-war period in UK politics. And we knew that when we worked for him, we knew it every day when we saw the way that he joined the dots, the way that he found solutions when no one else could find a way through, the way that he managed to lead and be led by his ministers. And we've certainly seen it. We've certainly understood it even more since Jeremy's death. We've seen that gaping hole, really, at the heart of UK policymaking and, and the UK government. Uh, so I'm very proud to be here in Jeremy's memory uh, as well. And also delighted to introduce uh, the absolutely brilliant uh, Jonathan Black, a, a very worthy uh, person to carry the name of the Hayward Fellow and to continue that legacy of Jeremy Hayward. Jonathan is renowned as one of the most extraordinary civil servants of this generation and tipped by all of us to go on to do even more extraordinary things and to lead the civil service through the challenges that, uh, that lie ahead. Uh, Jonathan, I've seen him close up become indispensable to several prime ministers, probably three in one year. I think we got through three last year, um, but several uh, over the years. And I have no doubt that that will continue. So it's a great coup for Blavatnik and for Hartford College to have, managed to have enticed Jonathan up here. We hope for a year, but he's already being tempted back into this, the heart of decision-making, and we'll hear more of that uh, later on uh, as well. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, this evening. As Cathy says, we'll have some questions immediately after uh, the lecture. We're gonna be hearing about a subject that's very much at the heart of whether the UK can bounce back and actually whether we can start to move on from this feeling that we all have that we're somehow in a, a 
a driverless world at the moment. We'll need policymakers like Jonathan who can join the dots between the politics and the economics and the security. It will be indispensable in the years ahead. So do store up your questions. I hope we'll get lots of time for questions in the room. We hope to take lots of questions online on the iPad. I hope they're coming through to us and will come through to us as Jonathan speaks as well. Um, but for now, please join me in giving a very, very warm, hearty Blavatnik welcome to the great Jonathan Black. Well, Tom, thank you very much for that very kind, if I'm not sure, entirely deserved, uh, entirely deserved introduction. But um, it's, I shall take it nevertheless. And uh, thank you all for making the time to, to come here this evening and to join me for my first lecture as, as Hayward Fellow. As a, as a civil servant for over 20 years who is used to being neither seen nor heard, it is a bit countercultural, to be honest, to be standing on a public platform here. But it is a pleasure to do so. Um, and I would like to thank the Hayward Foundation. I'd like to thank the Blavatnik School, Hartford College, the Economic and Social Research Council, as well as the Civil Service for supporting the fellowship. It's also a privilege and to hold this fellowship in memory of Lord Jeremy Hayward. There's not a lot more I think I can say to what Cathy and Tom have just said. For all of us who are civil servants of this generation, Jeremy was the dominant figure. The culture he championed, the standards that he set reached us all and were an inspiration to us all. But above all, I think what Jeremy, at least for me, was about, he championed a culture of policy making as problem solving. Indeed, I don't think there was a problem that wasn't there to be solved in Jeremy's mind and epitomized by the phrase that all of us will remember, who is gripping this? And um, the, aim, the aim of the fellowship is to capture that confidence in the problem solving power of policy making and to provide some space to think about a systemic policy making issue. So not so much the what of the policy itself, but more the how of the policy making. And the issue that I, or, or more to the point we, because I'm benefiting from the brilliant support from a, a brilliant team here this year, but also from the indirect wisdom of many more, the issue we're exploring this year is this, the intersection between national security and economic prosperity interests, and the step change in policy making needed for a new era, in my view, of complexity and uncertainty that is driven by geopolitical and wider trends where those interests are now more intertwined than ever before. Now, there's much to say about this, but for tonight's purposes, I want to focus on a, a narrower issue, economic statecraft and the role it has played over the, last, over the last 12 to 24 months in response to the security crisis arising from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But I will start by briefly setting out the broader context and why, in my view, for countries like the UK, this intersection between economic and security interests defined in the broader sense, and also the associated intertwining of our international and domestic interests is the systemic policy making issue of our time. Certainly in my time as the UK's G7 and G20 Sherpa, economic security went from being a, an add on to the very center of the agenda. And just to sort of give you a sense of, a sense of that, when we were first preparing for the, the presidency of the G7 in 2021, we proposed that there should be an expert report um, on economic security for the G7 leaders, a good bit of sort of a, a processology for a summit. And I'd like to commend Lord Sedwell, our former national security advisor who wrote that report and the other panelists for what in many ways is a very prescient report. But it is fair to say that there was some caution and indeed actually concern from both from other partners and from some within our own system about whether at a time of COVID and of climate crisis, this was a sufficiently high priority for the G7 um, or whether indeed actually it was a profound enough challenge to be looking at at all. Fast forward just two years and it was the very, very center of the Japanese uh, Hiroshima summit uh, this, this year. And it is increasingly dominating the agenda around the table, not just of international summits, but actually of domestic cabinet country, domestic individual cabinet rooms in individual countries, and also indeed of company boardrooms. And it is already, in my view, challenging key aspects of very established policy. 
So we are seeing the most significant reorientation in domestic economic policy in probably four decades as governments grapple with pricing security into much more active industrial and innovation policy. At the same time, and this is the focus of what I want to talk about tonight, in the most significant security crisis for eight decades in Europe, we have seen economic levers at the very center of the response. And with the trends that are driving these changes likely to, if anything, actually, I think, intensify further, we can expect, I think, this increased complexity and uncertainty to become the new norm. And whilst it's beyond the, the how remit of the fellowship, with all of this policy in flux, I think there is a very important policy and political debate to be had about what the new equi policy equilibrium for this new period should be. And importantly, how we find a way of doing that that protects the principles that makes us distinct as democracies. Now that debate has evolved, evolved, evolved very fast over the last year. Many of you will have seen the debate on, on de-risking and, and I welcome that. And it needs to keep going as these concepts get defined in practice because it really, really matters. How these intersecting interests are captured coherently will not just inform security and economic policy itself, but also our approach to some of the most systemic issues like demographic change, climate change, and, and above all, technological change, and so ultimately determine our future peace and prosperity. The how of the policy making matters too. And indeed, in the context of complexity and certainty, where policy is in flux, where there are no fixed formulas to follow, actually the process matters even more. Um, but just these, as these challenges are presenting, changes rather, are presenting challenges for policy, so they are for policy making. And these are not just minor challenges, in my view, for the way we go about doing policy. Both structurally and psychologically, policy is traditionally approached around economic and security as very distinct interests. But in an age where global interconnectedness means our interests intersect as never before, where geopolitical competition means that we are seeing a return to strategic statecraft, there are major questions for the way in which we think about and go about doing policy. And all countries are going to need to get much better at thinking strategically across interests and over time about our systemic policy choices and our approach to using every lever of the state in an integrated way. So in this very crowded debate of the what, I hope that the work of the fellowship and its focus on the how will be able to make a distinct contribution. And for those of you here at Blavatnik, I look forward to setting those out later in the year and discussing them with you all. Let me though now come on to the, the main focus of this lecture, which is, as I say, the lessons for around economic statecraft. These reflections are very much personal ones from my perspective as Deputy National Security Advisor, and as the senior official, at least in our system, responsible for coordinating the economic part of our response. Before I come to my reflections, though, I would like to pay tribute to the many colleagues who I work with on Ukraine, and indeed those who worked on it before and since. To our military, who have worked with their Ukrainian counterparts for the best part of a decade. To our intelligence agencies, whose assessment was so decisive to the many, many officials across Whitehall who worked tirelessly after the invasion, to our brilliant uh, colleagues in Moscow and Kyiv. But above all, I wanna pay tribute to the people of Ukraine, whose resolve and resilience I think is an inspiration to us all. They have paid a terrible price for Russia's aggression and its attempt to redraw Europe's borders by force and bring the continent back to something I think we all hoped that we had left behind. But we should be very cautious about drawing too many lessons from a particular crisis. And Russia is indeed a very particular case. But also, crises tend to force policy innovation and shake up systems in a way that just doesn't happen in normal times. And so I think it is important to learn from those and indeed sustain them. It's important, too, to learn from the past and the parallels that past precedents can provide for policymaking. So investigating the evolution of UK economic statecraft in the interwar period has been a core part of the fellowship's research. And that research has shown there is much, I think, that we can learn from that time. And I will come on to that in a minute. The starting point for this crisis is that economics has been a central feature of it, both in terms of the action and its impact. 
Because whilst the military conflict has been comparatively contained, the economic and the wider geopolitical one, the implications of that are genuinely global. And managing those implications, both the international policy development, but also the international political dynamics dominated much of my year, in particular in the run-up to the G20 summit in Bali, where as Sherpa, I led the UK's efforts with others to, to reach an agreed outcome. And it's continued to be the same for those uh, who've held my roles since. And the process of negotiating those summit statements, I think, have highlighted some of the geopolitical complexities. And it's that complexity that really is one of my most important reflections that I take from my time as Deputy National Security Advisor. For its part, Russia has been willing to use all of its economic advantages, particularly in relation to food and fuel. And with respect to the former, and this is something I've sort of added having thought about it, I think it has done so with a determination and an indiscrimination that I really do think should shock, if not surprise us. With respect to the latter energy, I think it should surprise us less, not least because it is aimed directly at those as it seems itself in conflict with. Now, there is, of course, a very salutary lesson about leaving ourselves exposed to such risks. But looking forward, I think there is, and from a wider statecraft perspective, I think there is an important lesson that Europe has managed to wean itself off Russian hydrocarbons with speed that is incredibly important for the future. And in doing so, governments were willing to throw the full weight of their sovereign balance sheets behind it. And I think that shows the degree to which this crisis has fully drawn in every aspect of state capacity. For the UK's part and the part of its allies, the use of economic instruments has also, of course, been at the forefront of the response. Uh, sanctions have been a feature of the global architecture for over a century. They were the principal enforcement tool envisaged by the League of Nations after the First World War and its successor in the UN Charter. And whilst used relatively sparingly during the Cold War, they have been in used increasingly since by many countries, both inside and outside of the architecture of the UN, most recently actually by ECOWAS in response to the coup in Niger. Now, there's always a sort of risk in saying that something has reached its sort of zenith. And indeed, actually, at the time, thinkers called the 1990s the sanctions decade. But I do think this time, starting with the response after in 2014 after Crimea, this really is the first time that sanctions have been used at such scale and against such an economy of such size, never mind a permanent member of the UN Security Council. I could spend many hours going through the process that we went through and developing, deciding and deploying the actions that we took. And I will spare you a lot of that detail. But I do just want to highlight a few points which I think are relevant to the future, but also actually include the limitations on what was possible. And I have four points I, I want to make. The first is about speed, scope and scale. In total, the UK has now designated over 1,600 Russian entities or individuals and trade controls that have reduced Russian imports and exports by, I think, over 90 and 70 percent, respectively. There was no, that there was no modern precedent meant that we had no playbook to follow when we were introducing these measures. And whilst there was preparation for the measures introduced on the day of the invasion, political appetite and practical reality very quickly meant that all of that was exhausted and that policy was being developed, decided and delivered in real time. And it was being done facing a situation where another country wanted to overwhelm its neighbour, not in weeks and months, but in hours and days. Within the UK, a subgroup of the National Security Council was formed, was stood up, bringing together officials from both departments, from the intelligence agencies and from our enforcement bodies, right across the economic and security spectrum, coordinated uh, in the cabinet office, but under the leadership of the foreign office and the treasury. The limitation of what was introduced in those very intense few weeks and months was actually not political appetite, nor really the flexibility of the system or indeed policy imagination. If you think about things like the oil price cap or the, the, the sanction on the, the Russian central bank. These were genuinely far-reaching innovations in international policy that I think few would have considered possible the day before the invasion. Actually, instead, the constraint was what was practically possible for our systems to absorb. 
And that is why, at least in the UK, emergency legislation was passed to celebrate the ability to designate and also additional investment has been put into the enforcement capabilities that then, that then follow. The second feature that I wanted to highlight is a balance to the first and is about the degree of effort that was put into avoiding unintended consequences, either on people in our own countries or in particular on those countries outside of and least able to afford the implications of the conflict. And the design of the oil cap that I referred to is probably the best example of that. With respect to our own countries, democracies have a responsibility and indeed a requirement that autocrats can disregard to sustain public support. That is an important factor. And indeed, in the event, actually, I think people have absorbed a very significant squeeze on their standard of living, knowing in part that it has been a result of standing up to aggression and defending our values. And I think for those who, who think about it, there is a lesson there for those who think there is comfort in the decadence of democracies. I would say perhaps the past few months suggest differently. I think we probably did get the balance right in the measures that we took. But there is, of course, an open question that we all never know the answer to about whether sharper action with its inevitable impact may nevertheless have been shorter lived and smaller in cumulative terms if it had helped to end the conflict sooner. With respect to the balance with other countries beyond our borders, I think this was probably one of the most complex areas that we had to work on internally and of course has been one of the most debated externally. The complexity is, is not new. Actually, if you look back to uh, the start of the, the First World War, it was concerns about the third country impacts of the blockade on uh, Imperial Germany that led Britain to resile from some of its early economic measures. For this time, it's also an area where our response has evolved most, I think, as experience has enabled us to have more sophistication. In practice, and rightly in my view, but unlike in the case of, going back to what I highlighted, in the case of Russia with respect to food, this was nevertheless a very significant limitation on what the measures we could have taken. The, the third feature that I wanted to come to about, about this round of, of, of sanctions and the measure we took is their role as a core component of a comprehensive strategy that also included uh, military assistance to Ukraine, humanitarian assistance to Ukrainian people, both inside and out of that country, as well as the diplomatic action against Russia. And I say that because Implicit in that is a recognition of the limitations of what sanctions can achieve in isolation. And this is relevant to how their impact should be assessed, and I will come on to that in a moment. But it's also relevant to how they evolve. They didn't evolve as a short and sharp decision, but rather were ratcheted up as part of probably, I think, the most intensive period of, of conducting statecraft comprehensively across uh, state capabilities in the crisis since the Cold War. From the very start, the decisions on sanctions were made either in the National Security Council or in the immediate days after the invasion in the so-called COBRA Crisis Committee. So alongside and not in, in isolation to everything else. But the fourth feature that I think is worth mentioning is the extent to which sanctions were implemented in partnership with other countries. Now, of course, the limitation there is that and it is an important one that I will return to, is that even with the unity across the G7 and its allies, that only accounted for around half of the global economy. But I think it is nevertheless worth pausing on the coordination that did take place, and in particular on the role of the G7, because it's not a given, or it wasn't a given. Because whilst all members of the G7 have their own legal regimes and have their own detailed measures, each wave of sanction was always coordinated in advance. And to illustrate the point, as, as G7 Sherpas, normally we would probably meet once a quarter. Um, at the height of the, the crisis, and for much of last year, we were meeting weekly, sometimes much more often as we worked across the, the three time zones in, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic and into the Far East. And I think probably not since the financial crisis have I been involved in a degree of such a degree of detailed coordination of international economic policy. I think we will see these informal groupings, the sort of variable geometry, as I think Anthony Blinken talks about, uh, play an increasing role in, in, in crises of this kind as we try to sort of balance the need for unified action with the need to be agile. And um, there was a time in 
after the financial crisis, when it was assumed, therefore, that the G7 would sort of wane and that the G20 would become the principal forum for global economic coordination. And in one sense, the G20 has become that. But the G7's role has evolved from just two years ago when there was no summit at all under, the, under the, the presidency of Donald Trump during COVID through the UK's presidency in 2021, which I would say this, wouldn't I, I think, help reestablish its purpose. It has become the principal forum for allied coordination, at least in this crisis. Now, I think there are practical reasons for that. The Sherpas and the political directors in the leaders' offices and the foreign offices are the relevant officials. But I think there's also its reflects political preferences, in particular of the United States, who have come to see the G7 in the sort of northern hemisphere and then the, the quad in the Indo-Pacific as their preferred co fora for coordination. And I think and you may have seen, I think back about a year ago, Jake Sullivan, the US Dep the US National Security Advisor, described the G7 as the steering group of the of the free world. Now I highlight these four points a broader and deeper range of economic tools targeted to avoid unintended spillovers, considered as part of a comprehensive security strategy and response, and done in coordination with others. Because I think these, these four things form the basis of how economic straightcraft is likely to evolve into the future. How it evolves will come, will it le will depend at least in part on how we come to assess the impact of this crisis. Now, it's, it's actually too early to do that, but it would be a, a, a cop out of me in this lecture to say nothing about it and not at least provide some, some perspective. Any comprehensive assessment, therefore, in my view, needs to not just be a san sanctions in isolation, or indeed so far, but of the role that they have played over time and as part of that overall strategy with respect to Russia's calculus. That assessment then needs to look at the individual measures, both differentially, but also collectively. So the financial measures that were designed to create the short-term shock, the designation of individuals designed to put pressure on elites, the trade measures designed to degrade economic and military capability, the energy measures designed to restrict revenues, but all designed collectively to try and impose cost on Russia, constrain its capacity to wage war and to cumulatively shape that calculus. The impact of those things will depend on the ability of the allies to sustain what's been in place and address efforts to get around them. At the same time, it will also depend on Russia's own response and the extent to which it can stay, sustain that. So for example, Russia ameliorated the short-term shock with stimulus, but how sustainable will that be? I think Russian defense spending is now a third of total spending. It is selling energy, but at a discount and with a significant revenue impact. But how sustainable is that? Revenues were about half of, at the beginning of last of this year to what they were at the beginning of last. And it is getting goods through, but it is short on some key dual use items. And how significant will that be on the battlefield and beyond? All of these things, the cumulative impact of these may only be at the margin, but these are circumstances where the margin may well matter. Because ultimately, notwithstanding the, all the uncertainties that we still face and the choices that Russia can still make, it will still be a more isolated economy with less trade, less foreign capital and less technology. And these are not prospects that make for a leading global power. Any assessment will also though, need to consider the implications for beyond this conflict and the wider international order, just as Nicholas Mulder did in his really good book that I'd recommend to you all on charting the, the experience of sanctions development in the first half of, of, of the last century. Because most importantly, any assessment needs to be made, in my view, against the counterfactual of what the other alternatives were with respect to the challenge to the international order. So it is a really important debate to be had about the precedent that the actions that have been taken set but the alternative would have either been to have a debate about no action in response to a P5 country's attempts to redraw its own boundaries by force and clear violation of the charter, or in a continent that has such a terrible respect, a history in this respect, to the implications of direct military conflict. That we are not having either of those two debates, I think is really important. 
And here, the insight of the UN former, the UN, former UN Secretary General Kofi Dinan in a different context is important. Sanctions can play an important role in the gap between words and war. And that was the very real choice that leaders faced last year. It may well be a choice that they face again. Either way, I believe that a new era of economic statecraft is here to stay as we grapple with today's challenges, just as they did in the first half of the last century. This will involve balancing the role that interconnectedness can play as a potential deterrent with the choices, but also the challenges for statecraft that interdependency also presents. The experience of the last century should obviously make us cautious, but equally, we should always be cautious too about the use of military force. So in the context of today's complexity and uncertainty, faced with a crisis, I think economic leaders may well continue to be the first and, for, first and foremost response that we have, as I mentioned, as we've just seen in the case of ECOWAS and Niger. So I do believe that if developed carefully, and that carefully is important, economic statecraft has the potential to play a much more central role in our security architecture for defence and deterrence. The implications of that are very profound for how we go about doing policy making in our countries. And as I set out in my introduction, above all, it will require a much more integrated approach across our systems. And that will be the focus of the, conclu of the conclusions and the recommendations that we make later this year. Before I close, though, I did want to offer some specific conclusions for economic statecraft and about the experience of the last year, both some sensible policy making steps, but also uh, some wider choices about where policy may go. And again, here I have four points. The first is that we need to put our on a much more formal structure around our economics. Uh, we need to put much more formal structure around our economic statecraft that has inevitably developed quite informally over the last year. My former US counterpart, Dilip Singh, has proposed that we should develop a doctrine sitting within our own, sitting within our overall security architecture that sets out the principles that should guide our approach with respect to economic tools in a way that's not dissimilar on, on the military side. And I, and I agree with that. Something like this structure would both provide internal clarity for decision making but also external clarity and comfort on our posture, including for those who are concerned what it might otherwise mean for them. And here, the fellowship's research into the, sort of, into the past is revealing a really surprisingly rich history of policymaking and precedent that we can draw on as Britain reflected on its, its experience in World War I. The archives at, at Kew down in, down in South London are, are striking, but have received, I think, little attention to some of the more tangible areas of the war on land and sea. This is despite the fact that actually our allies, British allies, appeared to regard what they called our full fighting service um, as one of the most decisive contributions to, to that struggle. In the records, you see a, a, deep, a deep, in, deep retrospection within the British state, in its own words, about um, overhauling the experiences of the late war over a wide range of subjects while the memory was still afresh. They set up something called the Interdepartmental Body um, on Trading and Blockade in a Time of War, which was ministerially led for 15 years across five successive governments of every persuasion. And that was charged with building up uh, an expertise and a strategy of the role of economic measures in foreign policy. It culminated in the production of a, of a handbook in 1938, but actually early versions came 10 years before. And something called the Joint Intelligence Committee, which many of you will be maybe familiar with in the British system, had its origins in that time as well. Together, all of these things were, were very, very significant capabilities, which not only appear to have ensured that the lessons of the war were integrated properly into peacetime, but that Britain was equipped and better equipped to make the trade-offs inherent in the use of economic measures across every foreign policy crisis that took place in the interwar period. Now, there's far too much to digest in, in all of that um, in one lecture, but the depth and the maturity of the thinking is really, really interesting, and I think should inspire some of our work today. The, 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 second, the second thing I think that we need to sort of reflect on, and it sits alongside the first, is that we need to strengthen and sustain the capability that we have 
for determining and delivering our economic statecraft policy, both in order to see, see through the game of whack-a-mole that we need to play with the current uh, measures in place, but also about putting ourselves on a more sustainable and, st and stable footing for the future. And that needs to include everything from developing the necessary capabilities of expertise, the infrastructure for analysis and assessment, systems for stress testing and scenario planning. And again, actually, the experience of the interwar period provides us with a lot that we can, there's a lot that we can learn from. The, the, third, the third point I wanted to make is that I think we need to think through quite hard about the, imp about the implications for how government and business work together in times of acute crisis like this, but also on the more chronic challenges that I, I talked about. The intertwining of economic and security interests necessarily has implications for the interface between the market and the state, and so then also for business and government. Indeed, in the extreme case of sanctions, businesses are at the front line acting as the government's agent. And in that respect, engagement with business was absolutely critical in developing the measures against Russia. But more broadly, in today's context, it is, it is essential that we are able to combine the security assessment that only governments can really do with the market insight that businesses are best placed to bring at every stage of the way in which we do policy. How that evolves requires quite a lot of careful thought and will be a, a key component to some of what we conclude at the end of the year. Where does it make sense to share more information and how do you do that when some of it is, is secret? When does it make sense for the government to intervene, but how do you do that whilst getting the right balance about the role of the state? And in the gap in between, what might the role for government be in advising businesses on making their own choices? The fourth and final, I'm pleased to say, uh, point I wanted to make is also we must consider how nations coordinate and cooperate. Now, countries will always need a backstop to defend their core national security interests. But remembering the original insight of the UN Charter and reflecting, I think, on the experience of the last year, we should reflect on the potential that it saw for how countries may coordinate in, in future through economic means in response to violations of the fundamentals of the international system and how we can do that in a way that is as broad based as possible. I think this really matters because economic tools could play an important deterrence and defense function in any future security crisis. And I've mentioned that already, but also because as we have seen over the last year, a security crisis can have very significant implications for the stability of the global economy. And as a contribution to this debate, and as part of the fellowship program, my colleague Jack Connolly, who is, who is over there, um, is publishing today a paper on the role of economic deterrence and it, the role it can play in upholding international stability. And I, will, I commend you all to read it. It's, his, his paper is much better than my lecture. Um, uh, but, but critically, Critically, coordination should look to encompass, in my view, action ag against a belligerent state with assistance to support those countries who have been affected by the aggression of that state and of any unintended consequences of action in response. And in many ways, I think that combination reflects the initial insight of economic statecraft in the interwar period, which is that that statecraft was most effective when it combined the sanctions stick with a positive sanctions carrot. And this was a, a feature of, as I say, of interwar thinking, including by the likes of John Maynard Keynes, who at that point was a, a, an official in the UK Treasury. And indeed, that went on to inform some of his thinking about the way in which the Bretton Woods architecture should be established in the post-war international institutions. This sort of coordination will require a stronger financial commitment from the countries who are able to provide it, as well as the international institutions, to stand behind ameliorating the impact of a belligerent's action. But it also requires, equally importantly, a stronger commitment from all to support such a mechanism that stands up for the fundamentals of the international system. Now, none of this is straightforward, and what should be possible in theory will be much more difficult in practice. But it is thinking that I think we need to do as we consider how economic statecraft should evolve. In conclusion, let me come back to where I started and the aim that we've set ourselves for this year's fellowship. As we face up to the implications of the changed geopolitical context, 
how does policy making itself need to change for this new era of complexity and uncertainty? The lessons that I've talked about here from developing and deploying economic statecraft over the past year, the importance of clarity on our, of our principles and what good policy making as a process looks like, of having the capabilities we need to collaborate effectively across our systems and to think about statecraft in the most strategic way, of analysis and assessment of information as an enabler of integrated advice, of the partnership between business and government in developing and delivering policy, and of collaborating with allies in doing the same. And then finally, of strong structures at the center of government that support the provision of integrated advice and accountability of decision making. These lessons, I think they apply as much to the wider interface between economics and security interest in the, in the context of broader, more chronic challenges as they do to the more the acute crisis of the last year. So we will be drawing on these as we attempt to put together the final recommendations uh, later in the year. And I hope the Q&A that we're about to have will help us inform some of that thinking. But as a very final word, I've inevitably here spent quite a lot of time talking about risk. And I think we do need to be very clear eyed about the challenges of the geopolitical context that we find ourselves in and of the downside risks that go with that and the difficult decisions that they imply. That said, at a time when there are no easy answers and no easy routes to, to growth, we should also be clear about the upside opportunity. Getting these difficult decisions right can mean that our economic and security interests reinforce each other. They don't have to always play against and can therefore reinforce both our future peace and prosperity. So returning to the inspiration of the fellowship, like Jeremy, I too believe in the, the problem solving power of policymaking and of its ability to find its way, our way through even the most complex of policymaking challenges. And I think this interface between economics and security is probably the most challenging of all. Thank you. Can we get down here? Very good. Um, so thank you so much, Jonathan. And I'm sure there's a lot of food for thought there, lots of challenges there um, to all of us. And so I would love to look now for questions in the room and uh, and online. I think we have some microphones which will float around. So if you would like a microphone, please start waving your arms around now. I think we've got one over here. Um, just while that's on the way, and then we've got one more in the front here. So we've got two, two there. So I think uh, the gentleman, the red, red shirt there, Hello, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for the for the brilliant uh, lecture. My question is whether there is any coordination among G7 members to avoid a uh, subsidies raise. So uh, you mentioned the concept of de-risking, but some may say that this is all protectionism. So with the excuse um, of cutting these interdependencies, the economic prospects of the countries who are engaging in this thing of cutting the interdependencies. For instance, the, the French president likes to talk about strategic autonomy and the European Union is adopting some policies in that way. We have seen the, the US also um, doing the IRA, so subsidizing companies that may be nowadays in UK soil or European soil uh, to go and produce that in, 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 the, in the US. So uh, you also mentioned one last point, um, the business and government cooperation. So, uh, of course, businesses have uh, market incentives to the risk, the value chains. So the question again is, are these market incentives not enough uh, to de-risk or is there a need for a government to step in um, and subsidize uh, these kind of industries? Thank you. Do I take those? I, as, as, as you wish. Yeah, let's, go, let's go for because there are two or three in there. So let's, let's okay. tackle so, those. I mean, on, on the... Um, on, on the first one, I sort of tried to touch on it and what I was saying in terms of where I think we are going through this very significant reimagining of what economic policy looks like. And I think we're going, I think we're in a sort of journey on that. And uh, I, we will at, at some point need to see what a new equilibrium, new equilibrium looks like. And 
things like you talked about the American IRA, things about the, what the, you know, the EU are doing with their chips. That's some of the things we're doing in the EU, all beginnings of an attempt to find a new way of balancing those, those interests. And I think that will continue to evolve. Um, I think you asked about de-risking. I think the concept of de-risking is, is, is a helpful one because I think it does recognize the nuance and the complexity. I think the sort of decoupling phrase, which was sort of used a bit before, was quite stark. Whereas I think de-risking recognizes that there are areas where of quite significant areas, in my view, of economic trade, which is, if you like, if you like, is normal. And there are indeed security advantages from, from some of the interdependencies and or at least the interconnectedness that goes with that. There are some areas where uh, it is more challenging and where we I think de-risking is a good is a good word to use. Now, of course, the the devil is in the detail of that, because even if you describe de-risking as being a um, you know, narrowly defined thing around economic, around to certain technology. Do you think about I mean, AI, which is something I'm working on now? You know, the potential dual use of a lot of technology means that that is very broad. So I think you're right to raise it as, as a question. But I think the, the phrase of de risking helps because I think it recognizes, it recognizes that nuance. One thing I sort of referred to in my lecture, though, was that as we go through that, it's very important to stay true to the basic principles that make us distinct as, as, as democracies. And there was a second question. I can't remember what it was. I'm sorry. Oh, it was about business and government. I mean, I would say, just to answer that briefly, broadly, um, as, as countries that are market broadly market-based economies and, and, and where we, there is nevertheless a role for the state in helping businesses make informed decisions. Now, in some areas, the state may decide it needs to intervene, and we have regimes for doing that. But in mo most areas, this will be about businesses making decisions for themselves. And... Um, that is about how and there's a potential role for the state there in helping businesses have the right information to make informed judgments about the about the choices they face. And on their supply chain, some about security, of course, some of it's commercial. I think we had a question in the front row here, and then I'll go to the pad and then back into the room. So like, thanks a lot for a very insightful lecture for dedicating your time. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the number of countries joining a sanctioning regime, actually, it, it's me here. <laughs> um, the number of countries uh, joining the sanctioning regime plays an important role in their effectiveness. Um, beyond G7, we haven't seen much traction and much eagerness to impose sanctions in the context of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, have you or your counterparts uh, tried to work with countries beyond G7 in the global south? And um, what was their feedback? Did you try to forge this? wider economic front. And as a little follow-up question, uh, do you think that the UN could play a larger role in this? Because we have seen that um, during the apartheid regime, the UN, uh, actually the emergency session of the General Assembly adopted a separate resolution on sanctions, and there, were, there was a global sanctions regime. Um, currently, we also have an emergency resolution opened into the Russian aggression, but neither of its six resolutions has broached the topic of sanctions. So do you see more potential in this? Thank you. So, um, do you want to get to one by one? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's so, do it. I, um, so I, I, I think there is, on, in relation to your question on the UN, and part of what I was talking about at the end, and Jack's, Jack's paper gets into this, is what is a sort of, if for the future is a broad-based mechanism that, that the UN Charter envisages in its, founding, in its founding documents for the role that economic leaders can play in upholding the international order. And I, and I think we should try and find that, and that needs to combine, as I say, this balance between sort of positive and negative sanction. Um, it would never have been possible in this situation because the country in question is a permanent member of the council. Um, and but I hope that I hope and I do think that done well we can start thinking about how economic statecraft and the roles can play in terms of providing greater deterrence on some of these some of these things in the future. On your on your first point, um, I mean you are right. It's a, you know roughly half of the world economy has has, in, has imposed measures on Russia. Um, others haven't. I mean for many it was not it was not a sort of a, a relevant a relevant matter. And this is not the first time that you've seen measures introduced in a way that is sort of selective, if you like. You know, it's quite a lot of countries, and I mentioned ECOWAS, introduced sanctions outside of a sort of fully international formula. And I think that we will see that continue. One of the things that, uh, the only thing I would sort of say about from my own views on these things is things like the oil cap is a good example here. Actually, what mattered for us in terms of implementing the measure was about restricting Russian revenues and not Russia not being able to benefit, if, if you like, from a higher oil price in part as a result of its own action. Um, 
but and but obviously um, within that countries then have a series of choices to make about who they buy and sell from but our strategic objective was less about that and was more about the revenues if that makes sense can I follow up on the uh, yeah. on the machinery point that you need to talk mm. about Blinken and variable, variable geometry? If you're thinking about many in this room will be going on into leadership positions in the next sort of 20, 30 years and playing a key part in these sorts of negotiations. So if your theory is right that uh, economic security work will be more central to foreign policy and statecraft, where will the load bearing work be done? I mean, is, is it better that they think more about the G7, the G20, the UN Security Council? So it's a, it's a really interesting question. And broadly, the, inter, the international architecture is even more siloed between economics and security than most domestic systems are. And also, broadly, at least outside of trade policy, the international system is on the economic side is much more informal than the security side, which is a bit more formalized, at least the sort of, you know, the regional groupings like NATO. So um, I think there is an interesting set of questions about actually how do you how do you formalize what some of the economic measures look like? My own or the mechanisms of the economic measures. My own, I mean, my own view is I I personally do think for the reasons I was just talking to you about, about I think the UN has an important role in here, but we do need to recognize that in some of these in some of these conflicts, either rightly because they're regional or because of the sort of difficult the difficult politics, these other in more informal groupings, whether it's the G7, whether it's ECOWAS, whether it's I don't know, ASEAN in a different format if it goes in that direction. They're likely, I think, to play quite an important role. But most of those economic groupings are not used to thinking about the security dynamics of some of what they do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take one from the iPad. So um, Emily Jones uh, would like to hear your thoughts on how the UK should position itself in the context of US-China tensions and increased weaponization of economic interdependence. Um, and she cites the example of cutting China's access to advanced semiconductors. Tricky one. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, yeah. But uh, I mean, we've uh, the, uh, the best thing I'll point everyone to is the is the the integrated or the refresh of the integrated review that we published in in January this year or March this year. So it was after I after I left my time in government, but I was sort of involved in the, in the drafting of it before we, we before we did. But maybe I'll sort of give an give, I'll let me give you an example because it may come up. I'm currently also involved in the. Um, the AI in the forthcoming summit on AI safety that the UK is going to host. So I think that's just a sort of good example of um, what I think is a you know the approach on you know, the approach on China as it is indeed on on this as on on other areas, which is um, we are very clear about the, the the growing the growing challenge that that comes from comes from some of what is coming from China and on issues like AI in many many areas we are not going to have aligned aligned approaches um, and we'll have our own ways of doing things. Equally, there are areas around a shared set of interests about sort of risks and threats, for example, from non-state actors and how AI may, may be misused that um, we will look to the cooperate on. And I think that is that is going to have to be the sort of model, if you like, for the international. But for our sort of international engagement, that just sort of recognises the complexity, if you like. But Tom, you'll have a view on that yourself uh, as well. I'm, I'm enjoying hearing your evolution from being a treasury uh, official to being a classic diplomat. It's beautiful <laughs> to, to, to watch that. Um, right, we're going to move in this direction. Do we do I see hands over there? Yes, we got a mic. Brilliant. And I'm just looking for arms over here for the next one. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. Um, I had just two quick questions, which was, do you think um, reflecting over the coming years, we'll look back at this period and say we were probably a bit complacent up to 2010, 2015, and that um, we should have been doing more, the kind of four conclusions that you saw at the beginning? Or do you think we'll say, actually, some of the things that have been happening were so extraordinary that it wouldn't be reasonable for us to expect it? Um, and actually, I'll leave it just the one question. I'll go for that one. So I... Um... The hindsight's a brilliant thing. So, but I would I would say, so let's say looking forward, I think we're entering into a period where of I sort of talked about it in the lecture of of increase, but sustained increase in uncertainty and complexity in the policymaking environment that is going to pull our security and economic and international and domestic interests together. And I think that presents some very profound challenges to how we all go about doing doing policy making. Um, and that is going to be a feature of you know years to come in 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 my view. Um, I, I think probably in one sense the period after 1989 was a very unusual period in one sense as well. And so have we? 
how quickly have we caught up with some of those changes? I mean, that's sort of that's the sort of the, the sort of thing to. I mean, that's the right thing to debate. And clearly, in some cases, we are sort of catching up in places. I would, um, I would, I would say though, I think that in relation to the. The, the subject we've been talking about tonight. I mean, I think it was very hard, I think, for anyone to really think that, I mean, I said it here, that most of us who were Europe, who, who grew up in Europe would thought that we'd left behind an attempt to redraw Europe's borders by force. I mean, it's just not something I think any of us grew up thinking would ever happen. And it's sort of shocking that it is. So I think it's quite hard to have anticipated something, something, something like that uh, as, as taking place. But I do think just going forward, we're going to have to be, and as I say, have to be smart about that because you know the, the global economy is going to continue to be integrated and there's going to continue to be a lot of you know, very significant benefits going to come from that. The question is how you sort of manage some of the other, the, the, the complexities of it that that we're not there at the beginning. Right, what we're gonna try and do is three quick fire questions, which you will effortlessly fuse together into a breathlessly okay. good answer. We're running, we're running short of time. So I have one over here, uh, one over here, and, and one in the middle here. So um, if we could get the mic moving in this direction for those two. Um, quick fire, can I just say that, um, thank you for your talk, and can I say how much I admire the civil servants? Because as you say, there were no formulas and there was a crisis and you did a lot of work. But my question is really about optimism and pessimism. I mean, I, I, I like the fact that you're thinking ahead and, and we're gonna use this integrated thinking about economics to try and snag um, future security crises. But surely what your experience must have left you quite saddened and pessimistic. We've had questions about sanctions, which I might have asked about. You've had questions about the difficulty of cooperating with allies. And we've got this very divided authoritarian versus free world split that's going on. Um, and, and, you know, we've got AI and so on. I mean, if, if I was going to say, what could you do for the next big crisis, which is apparently Taiwan, um, in, in, from your various uh, experiences, or should we just say this is excellent, but we're still pessimistic? Well, that's all. Optimism and pessimism. I think uh, just here, and then, and then just into the middle here, please. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, super appreciated it. I guess my question is like, let's assume best case, like sanctions, super effective. Russia tomorrow pulls out of Ukraine, like ideal situation. Um, what is the reintegration going to look like of Russia back into the global economy to make sure that that doesn't happen again, that we don't see that sort of turn toward authoritarianism or expansion into the former Soviet Union that we've seen over the past, like, 15 years? Great question. Thank you. Quick question. Um, how do you view the expansion of BRICS? So there we are. So we've got optimism and pessimism, particularly the next crisis yeah. is Taiwan. Uh, this is this is a pretty challenging from it's quite hard to agenda, put all these together into one to feel, one feel answer. Feel free not to fuse them together. Um, that might be a work of genius, actually. Um, mm -hmm. What happens to Russia? Can we reintegrate Russia in the future? Yeah. And then wither the bricks. So let me um, let me go in reverse order because the last those two are a bit specific, and yours is a bit more of a sort of more more sort of you know personal view. I mean, I so I mean, let's see what happens with with the the, the bricks expansion. I mean, what's interesting. I, What's interesting about it is they're quite a diverse group of countries that you've got in that in that group. And you know, what has been the effect of what has made the G7 effective over the last year has been the fact that despite what you've said about the challenges sometimes of coordinating, is that broadly is it's been able to act in unity. I mean, that's been the that's been the strength of it as a as a body. And the the challenge for any group as you broaden it out, particularly with a group of countries who are very different, is that it's become much harder to 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 co to go here. Um, the broader point I'm making, now, sorry, I'm going to run on here by a little bit, is that the other thing that's really different, I think, about previous periods is that you, we do now have a much more multi multipolar world, and um, and you know we may be going back from a unipolar into a more bipolar one into the, the very big powers, but you have a series of very significant other powers who are powers in their own right, and that that made for my work, for example, on the G320, extremely extremely complex. What it does mean is I just think these different groupings are going to be much more prominent. We're going to see a much more variable geometry, mixed economy, whatever language you, 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 you want to use. So I think we'll see. I mean, I, you know, I'm, you can see I've sort of, I, I think the challenge for that, for the, any of those is, is coherency, but obviously what they, they do present is a, you know, a sort of a, a challenge for sort of balancing of the order. On, um, 
on Russia and the sort of future, and this is the bit on the answer, I guess I'm going to be at the pessimist again rather than the optimist again of the spectrum. I mean, going back to one of the questions that somebody else asked, I mean, I think this is one area where we do need to reflect on, you know, what we you know what happened in the late in the 90s and all the way through in terms of how we ended up where we did with Russia and the role that we did. I think it is very hard. You know, the outcome that you just said it will be ideal, but it's not, you know, it's not we're not gonna wake up and find that tomorrow. I think it's gonna be a very long road. Um I I I, I struggle to see sort of easy, easy prospects, to be honest with you, for where we will see a sort of an easy reintegration of Russia back into the back into the global economy. I mean, clearly, it's, it's for the, the benefit of the Russian people and for others. There is some. It's important for us to see where that goes, but it's. But I think we're a long way from that. I'm afraid. Um, on on the pessimism and optimism point, I mean, I I mean, I I, met, I tried to finish what I was saying by being a, a bit optimistic because I sort of, I sort of am actually. I mean, you've touched on AI and technology. I mean, I think fundamentally, you know, the path of the I sort of do believe personally, the path of human progress tends to be, you know, to profit, it tends to be forward and 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 onwards. I think we need to be, you know, we've been in a probably in a slightly more sort of innocent age for most of the time that I've been, you know, I've been a sort of alive or whatever. And I think at least as a sort of somebody who's been able to, you know, as an adult, and I think we're entering into a more a more complicated one. Um, we're going to have to work much harder at how we sort of coordinate. I don't think that's, by the way, just about some of the security things that we've been talking about. You know, COVID, climate, all of these things have shown us have shown, shown us those things, but. Um, you know, particularly, I would say this to those of you as students here here in the room. You know, that is actually what policy is there for. I mean, it's there to sort of grab these things and try and resolve them through. And um, it doesn't always succeed. It doesn't. It's not always a straight straight road, and it's not always of those things. But in the end, actually, policy can find a way of going through those things. And I, I personally do believe there are ways in which our uh, the sort of intertwining of our economic and security interests does mean that the two can inform in, um, reinforce each other. I don't want to distract from that note of optimism because that's a lovely uh, point to end on. But when, um, when you've when you've done the work with the team, yeah, it goes back, it goes back into the system. Yeah, hopefully you and the team are back in the system, helping to get it operationalized, taken up, and the and the UK gets good at this stuff over time. And when you look around, who who else do you see doing it well? Where where else is this conversation happening? Who's currently doing economic statecraft well? And who's thinking? effectively about the economic statecraft. So I think everyone finds it very hard. And on the wider way that we've been doing this year, not just on sort of economic statecraft, but on the broader sort of intersection between economic and security interest, it's quite interesting. You, we've been we've been lucky enough to go around bits of the world. And when you go to the countries and you say, you know, they all say, oh, well, somebody else is doing it better than we are, which by definition sort of can't be true in the end. Somebody, and so I would say everyone everyone is finding it difficult. There are examples where some countries do some things better than others, and I would actually say I think you know, I, I think the UK finds it difficult. But there are things that the UK does do does do well. There are things that we can learn on from others. I don't think there is any country who really does it well. And I and I sort of said this in what I was saying before. I think that all of us have to really make a sort of step change to get our head around the sort of complexity of the way in which policy is going to evolve over the next over the next um, over the next twenty years. When I say everyone, I do include, by the way, just as a sort of point, sometimes people say, well, China does it really well. And, you know, the democracy find it harder. And obviously, as democracies, it, you know, makes things more difficult than, than, than sometimes for others. I, I, you know, I think all countries, including, including China, sometimes will struggle with how, how you manage some of these interfaces between your domestic and international and your economic and security interests. So I'm not going to quite answer your question by actually, because I don't like getting anyone does it really well. There's a challenge then to the next generation of policymakers and, of course, to you and your work and your team. Uh, as you move forward, I'm afraid that we are out of time. So unless anyone is really desperate to get one very, very quick question in, which I'm not seeing, um, I think it just falls to me to say a huge thank you to Jonathan and to Blavatnik and to the team for the work uh, you're doing. You've laid out some very complex challenges, but also given us some hope that policy can find a way through and creativity, the creativity of a, of a Jeremy Hayward or a Jonathan Black or many of those uh, in the room can find ways to fit to fix to join the dots and uh, and find ways through these these challenges that certainly leaves me feeling um more encouraged as well so best of luck to you with your work but also to all of you as you take this work forward uh, as well in this brilliant uh place so please join me in thanking john
Thank, thank you all for making the time. And for those of you who are new students um, on the programme here at school, I'm really looking forward to meeting you more over the course of the year. So thank you for, thank you for joining us. And I think there are some drinks. If you want to colour Jonathan with your other questions, I think there are some drinks outside. So please join us there. Brilliant. I